Hello, good day to everyone. My name is Kerry Roberts, and I'm with Fake JSAL from the Joint Special Operations University located in Tampa, Florida. I want to welcome everyone to another online interview series that explores research and publications of JSAL faculty, resident senior fellows, leading academics, and the wider SOF and international security community. Our Think JSAL online collection of interviews with authors and researchers is a supplement to our publication series, and we encourage you to view future offerings on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and APAN, the All Partner Access Network. Today, as part of our Irregular Warfare series, we would like to welcome a most unusual guest to Think JSAL, Mr. Lou Ferrante. Mr. Ferrante hails from New York City and is a former member of the infamous Gambino crime family. After a massive FBI and U.S. Secret Service sting operation in 1994, Mr. Ferrante was arrested, convicted, and sent to federal prison. In an incredible story of moral redemption and personal transformation, Mr. Ferrante turned his back on crime for good and successfully appealed his conviction after serving eight and a half years. While in prison, Mr. Ferrante applied himself to rigorous self-education, reading great works of literature, philosophy, and history, and studying the writing styles of the great classical authors. Since his release, Mr. Ferrante has become an internationally best-selling author, television documentarian, and speaker, and is considered an international authority on organized crime and gang culture. His publications include Unlocked, The Life and Crimes of a Mafia Insider, and Mob Rules, What the Mafia Can Teach the Legitimate Businessman. Lou, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kerry. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me a little more about yourself and why you chose to write about organized crime. Well, I, I, I educated myself while I was in prison. So um, there was some type of really, really uh, great value that prison had for me. Had I never gone, I would have never read my first book. And I would have never gone on to read the thousands of books, some of, some of which you can see behind me. That's an impressive uh, library. Yeah, while I was in prison, uh, I fell in love with reading. I would have never known. I would have never picked up a book. Um, and I, I, my love for books um, has really, really changed my life because uh, it's given me moral compass, uh, taught me more about the wide world around me. Uh, and also by mulling over each book I read, um, just the exercise of thinking about uh, science and history and biographies and whoever and whatever subject you might be engaged in, there's always some type of value if you think about it and ponder it. And you see that the world has sort of like uh, a system of rewards and punishments for people who do live the right way. And I was able to see that while I was in prison and began to change my life. Uh, but it did stem from books and reading. Uh, that was the first step forward for me uh, with regard to change. Uh, I came to reading uh, rather, I came to uh, the writing about organized crime uh, because when I first left prison, I had studied uh, every subject under the sun, and I desperately wanted to write about other things. I had written a novel while I was in prison, uh, and I wanted to write uh, about World War II, uh, about a biography, about some of my, um, my favorite individuals throughout history. And I learned when I started to pitch my ideas to publishers that nobody wanted anything but my story, but prison, but the mafia. These are the things that people uh, in, the, in the publishing world wanted me to talk about, wanted me to write about. And I resisted for quite some time. I didn't want to look back at that life. I felt like it was dirty. It was a dirty part of my soul that I had cleansed. And mm -hmm. I did not want to go back that way and, uh, and revisit those, those horrible paths that were so familiar to me but also caused me great remorse. Um, so I resisted for quite some time until finally I realized that the writing world pushes people to write about what they know. And it was something I knew very well. So as time passed, I was eventually able to, I guess with um, more reflection say, well, you know, it's not me now, but I do understand this world. I experienced it, I lived it. I have great insights to share with people. Maybe I should write about it. Uh, and my father, rest his soul, um, I bounced it off him and he said, of course, you know, what are you even thinking about? You know, give in. If that's what they want, that's what you know, then the fit is there. And my father was a very practical man and uh, I took his advice. And I started to write about this world and talk about it. And, um, and people write me from all over the world 
telling me how much my books have changed their lives. I'll give you a, for instance, I was um, invited to speak in Australia. And Australia, even though it was founded uh, by um, boatloads of convicts, they don't allow uh, people with records in their country, with criminal records. And I wanted to uh, attend the speaking engagement so that I, so I applied for a visa and they knocked me down because of my record. So I went through my fan mails and I was able to locate quite a few fan mails from Australia um, in which people told me they turned away from crime after reading my books. So I said, gee, here I have these, these letters from Australian citizens telling me how much they helped them. So I first uh, reached out to the people who were in Australia and asked them if it was okay to share their letters because I wouldn't have done that without their consent. Uh, when they told me go ahead, I was happy because that meant number one, they were still crime free. If they went back to criminal activity, they would not have wanted me to share their emails. So they said, sure, feel free to share those emails. You did change my life. And uh, I reapplied for my visa and I was granted a visa. Uh, despite three uh, felony convictions, I was granted a visa to Australia. Uh, so, you know, just to give you an idea of how much um, my thoughts, I guess, have gone around the world and helped so many people in different places. That's just one example in one country. But I get emails from all over the world. Uh, and my show on Discovery Channel, which was about gangs and gang culture, aired throughout the globe and was, was one of the, at the time, one of the Discovery Channel's highest rated uh, series around the globe. And it did phenomenally well. Um, and that also too uh, uh, changed a lot of people and also too it changed the government of the Philippines um, perhaps for the worst, because um, Duterte, who has not turned out to be, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, you know, mixed, I have mixed feelings about him, but in a lot of ways, I'm not, I'm not very happy with him in the Philippines. So then again, though, the Philippine people are happy with him. And uh, so I am told um, the documentary I had filmed in the Philippines changed the government. Duterte used it to come to power. And he did invite me there to watch it in front of parliament. Uh, and it has been covered. Time Magazine's World Desk covered the article in, uh, in which uh, Duterte had reached out to me and asked me to come to the Philippines. So it's an interesting story. Uh, again, you don't always know what the effect will be of your books or your documentaries, um, but I mean them for well. Uh, and in this case, it shows you at least the impact that a well-made documentary can have on the entire country. Uh, the, the letters I've gotten from the Philippines, I can't even count. They're countless. Um, the emails uh, specifically. Um, so that's one example. But again, I did the Camorra in Italy. I did um, vicious gangs in El Salvador. I went into the jungles in El Salvador. I locked into prisons with 18th Street, who was the rival gang to MS-13. Um, and I got to know these people and what makes their brains tick. And I did meet with the commandos. I met with the highest government officials in El Salvador. And I was able to get all sides of the, uh, of the problem and try to understand um, what was happening there. And I was able to actually offer some, some really sound advice in the end, uh, which I hope helped, uh, at least temporarily it did. Uh, long term, I'm not sure El Salvador has slipped back into a problem now. Uh, but at the time, I was able to help in a lot of ways. Well, that's uh, really inspiring, Lou. Um, and there's no question your experiences and your writings have benefited a lot of people, uh, benefited the world crime fighting, uh, and, and now I'd like to talk about how it could possibly benefit us in the Defense Department. And that's one reason why we at JSAL decided to reach out to you. Um, so next question is, uh, is more connected with the you know, defense policy. So in your view, is there a connection between transnational organized crime, and that's the technical DOD term for international crime, uh, and America's strategic priorities and our national security interests that we at SOCOM should be aware of? Yes. Uh, so I'm, I currently writing a history of, the, of organized crime, of the mafia, beginning in Sicily. And I follow the Sicilian immigrant wave over to the United States in the early 20th century, late 19th century, into the early 20th century. And then I follow the rise of organized crime in this country uh, until there's a turning point, and then, I, and then I trace its decline. But I will say that the beginning of organized crime in the United States, uh, with regard to like, let's, let's say, for example, the bootlegging era, prohibition, um, the, fall, the, uh, the crash, the stock market crash, organized crime capitalized on that as well. They came out of, um, th these examples of organized crime in early America are perfect 
models slash prototypes for what um, our government is confronting in other countries who are nascent countries now or failing states and you know returning to sort of like a, a, um, a position of, uh, I guess to say, sort of like a pre-state um, mode, the way some of them are, have, have, have um, devolved at this current time. So for example, in the United States, prohibition during the prohibition era, there were a lot of corrupt officials. The prohibition agents were corrupted. The politicians began to get corrupted. In New York alone, uh, the New York mafia controlled Tammany Hall. And Tammany Hall was the decider of, of all of the uh, Tammany politicians were always the ones to run New York, uh, and ex with the exception of Fiorello LaGuardia, who was a Republican, but he still had to deal with Tammany. Uh, so the mafia had such a stranglehold over so many corrupt officials throughout the country. And when Estes Cafalva came along in the, 19, uh, in the late 1950s, he saw that this connection between organized crime and corrupt officials in America, police departments, law enforcement, agents, agencies, and politicians. And he wanted to go out there and expose it. And he did sort of like this road show across America where he went to, to various cities and he exposed the connections between organized criminals and our politicians and police departments. And in doing so, uh, Cafalva made a, a really, really a, a grave error. He connected the mafia a lot of times with political beliefs. For example, when the mafia was controlling the unions uh, in the age of, of uh, labor industrial racketeering, when it first came and started in this country, we had a, a strong communist influence in America. It was on the heels of um, Lenin uh, seizing uh, control in Russia, followed by Stalin and his ejection of Trotsky. And then Trotsky was trying to export communism around the world. And he did do a lot of harm to America with communist people. And because the mafia was involved in the unions and so were the communists, a lot of times the mafia just sold to the highest bidder, whether it was management workers, whoever. And because they were a lot of times in bed with the, the communists, Estes Cafalva mistook, mistook the mafia for being ideologues and said, well, they're communists. They're not communists. The mafia will go anywhere where the buck is. And I think that's important for the, the uh, American government today, the United States government dealing with other countries, to know that when they're dealing with corruption on an organized criminal level, and, that, and that criminal, those criminals are connected to politicians, the criminals have absolutely no desire to influence policy. They don't care, they're out for the buck. And the politicians are using the criminals to make money and keep them in power and force through their policies, whatever they may be. So I think it's important to understand that, that there's a really strong difference between the criminals and the people who are utilizing the criminals. Uh, for example, I did a documentary in South Africa. And when I went there, I learned that um, the government was corrupt and allowing the elephants to be slaughtered for their tusks and the rhinos to be slaughtered for their horns. Why would the government allow their own country to be depopulated, the animal, the, uh, the, more, the most exotic animals on the brink of extinction to be depopulated? They were doing it because the Asians were bringing in tremendous amounts of money and they were uh, pouring this money into the infrastructure of the country. And if some Asians wanted to take home the animals because it's thought of ha having uh, medicinal value in Asia, so be it. Who cares? We're out for the bribe. So, so there's two different worlds that are colliding and making a single country into a hell. And, and that's just one single example. Um, there's another example when I visited Poland, um, which was very interesting. The Polish never had a mafia. And when the wall fell, suddenly Poland had an, a, 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 a mafia emerged in Pruszka, which is part of Poland. Mm. Where did this mafia come from? I went and talked to them. And they said, well, when the wall fell, you know, it wasn't like, you know, if you committed a crime, they came in the middle of the night and stamped you out and you were never seen again or heard from. We had human rights, we had laws, and we could take advantage of the system. So we created a mafia. And the movies we watch are in America, American movies, and, you know, they promote organized crime, and, you know, it's very romantic, so we saw it as that, and here we are. And this, this just, like, I was startled by this response that democracy and human rights could contribute to a mafia. I mean, this, this is some of, the, some of the things, though, we have to contend with, because I think it's important to have democracy and human rights. I'm a believer in both. So I think, though, we have to be aware, though, that oftentimes 
the more free a country is and the more uh, preserved that justice system is, as, as Immanuel Kant said, the, uh, the firmest pillar of good government is justice. Uh, I think that it's necessary then to understand that there are a lot of bi uh, evil byproducts of that and we have to confront them when they emerge in certain countries. Maybe had we worked with the Polish uh, authorities quickly and we could have stamped them out in a legal way much quicker because we would have been on top of it sharing with the Polish authorities what we know about the mafia having learned it over the decades here and we could have shared it with the Polish authorities who would have been one up on the criminals because they would have had our information. So too bad we weren't able to advise them before those, that, that, that particular mafia emerged. Yeah, well, you, you've identified a very clear nexus there, Lou. Um, and if I could add, the past couple of national security strategies have consistently identified transnational organized crime as a strategic risk to our national security interest, international order. And, you know, as we've discussed previously, uh, our special forces guys are overseas. They're in a lot of weak and fragile and failing states. They're engaging in what we call foreign internal defense, security force assistance, advising other governments. And it's pretty obvious from this discussion we're having, this is something that our operators downrange could encounter. Mm -hmm. th that connection between these weak and failing, fragile states and international uh, transnational organized criminal elements. Mm -hmm. Doing the things you're talking about, the poaching, the drug running, mm -hmm. illicit trafficking. Mm -hmm. yeah, that that's so, pretty clear. Yeah, it is clear. And so, so I think what you're gonna, what you're gonna find is, 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 is two variations of it as well. I think in certain failed states, you're going to find obviously the criminals have run wild and, and they basically become like African warlords of old where they've taken over countries and, uh, and it's still around some of them where they've taken over segments of a country uh, and Chinese warlords too, before uh, Mao and Chou Enlai came along, the Chinese warlords had done the same thing with China. They had parceled it out uh, to a certain extent where, you know, there was no Mao, there was no one single leader um, that could really, really hold position as long as Mao did. Um, and I think you're going to find that a lot in the failed states where criminals have, have uh, achieved this, this uh, sort of like position in society where they have so much money and power that the people who are quote unquote running society rely on them to keep them in power. And you'll see that oftentimes. There's, there's an argument to be made even with Mexico. You know, how much does the Mexican government rely on cartels or are they, uh, you know, sort of like coerced by the cartels to leave them alone to what extent because you know they're afraid for their own lives or the money is too much or what have you with the bribes corruption we would never know because we'd have to have you know really close sort of like fbi slash cia slash uh socom investigation into the government to know and they're not going to allow that to happen i don't believe but there is also to the flip side of the coin countries like china or russia which aren't failed countries but they're willing to sort of like turn a blind eye to larger organized criminal organizations so long as it's sort of like a cudgel against their enemies. So, for example, the, uh, the um, theft of intellectual property. China has no, doesn't make sense for them to clamp down on that. You know, why should they? It's, it, you know, that theft from America's internet intellectual property will make China stronger in the end. So China will turn a blind eye and say, you know what? You know, maybe they'll lock up a couple of uh, nerdy kids in a, in a room one day and say, yeah, we're, you know, we're cracking down, but they're going to leave the, the, the bigger criminals alone. And also, too, the cell phone industry is something that's, that's uh, something that could be looked at. Uh, most of our cell phones here in the United States are made overseas in China, um, and China has great power over us through our communications system. Um, so, you know, will, if somebody did do something uh, illegal, go getting back to the criminals and the, the, the uh, organizations that run wild in these countries. So that's a different example of a, of a larger, more powerful state, nation state, that might be willing to turn a blind eye. Then there are the smaller ones in South and Central America, where the, the people in power are reliant on the criminals. And there's a strong connect, connection there. That's a little bit different. It's not more, it's not, it's not um, as I, I guess the best way to say it is a geopolitical strategy, whereas China and Russia might have a geopolitical strategy of allowing the Russian oligarchs to do what they want, to do as they please. And there are plenty of them living in London. You know, well, well you know, that's fine. If they, if, they, if they corrupt London, what do we care? If it benefits Russia in some way or another or weakens our, our adversary. 
they don't care. You know, it's, it's, I, I think that's, that's sort of like the two different flip sides of the coin. Interesting. So on the spectrum of nation states, you know, from failed, weak, failing states, all the way to the great powers, so to speak, China, Russia, rising powers, like they're trying to exert their regional influence, like Iran. What about violent extremist organizations like Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, ISIS? Um, would they be, would you think the transnational organized criminal elements be willing to work with them if it's the highest bidder? Yeah, they would. So it's, so again, criminal, criminal organizations are non-ideological. So they would work with the highest bidder. Uh, when the pandemic hit here in the United States, even before it hit here, when it was in Wuhan and then hit Italy, uh, when I saw how hard it hit Italy, uh, I said to my wife, I said, put in a Google alert for a mafia pandemic. And I said, sure enough, there's going to be something quick. They're going to capitalize on this pandemic in one way or another. And sure enough, within a couple of weeks, my, my maybe a few weeks went by, my wife said, Oh, there's an article. You were right. It just popped up. The mafia is capitalizing on the pandemic in Italy. I said that they would because I know how they operate. They wouldn't want the pandemic. They wouldn't spread the pandemic. They wouldn't go out of their way to, to release a virus into the environment. They would never do that, the mafia. But once it's out and it's being done, they are very flexible and agile. And they will respond to the crisis as they are doing now in Italy. And the United States mafias will do the same thing. New York is going through hell right now. At some point, we'll read, maybe take six months, it might take a year, but you'll read that Georgie Big Nose or, or Vito, Vito Square Lip or whatever was involved in uh, the, the, the distribution of masks. His company uh, got the no bid from the such and such administration, whether it was uh, you know, the mayor or the governor, or, or they didn't know who it was because his wife was fronting as the operator, uh, as the CEO. And you'll see that they capitalized on this very, very dilemma, this pandemic that we're experiencing now, this crisis. Uh, they'll capitalize on it. So that's going to happen in all of these countries. And you have to be aware that they're non ideological and they're, they're quick to move fast. Their mind works fast um, and they don't care. So, for example, though, Hezbollah, let's say, uh, Al Qaeda, uh, with, with regards to Israel nowadays, um, uh, I feel that the public sentiment, uh, the PR battle, is sort of turning against Israel, which is sad because it's allowing the way for a lot of terrorists to to get away with what they shouldn't be getting away with. Um, I'm not saying I'm not uh, sympathetic to anybody else's cause, the Palestinian cause, for example. You know, there may be things that have to be done on both sides, but I do firmly believe that um, that the PR battle is being lost, which will allow them to get away with a lot more, and eventually criminals will work with them and see that opening. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, again, we have to have the will and determination to fight terrorism or organized crime at every level, and I think that's necessary. And, you know, there's a wrong and there's a right, uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's, what we decide as a nation is wrong and right, obviously, because there's no, there's no objective wrong and right. And Herodotus made that point centuries ago, millenniums ago. So, you know, I understand that. But there is a real, there's, there's something that, you know, we have values. And I think if we hold to our values and we know what they are, we should stand by them in whatever, wherever we go around the world. Okay, you made some very keen observations on a variety of points there. I'd like to take us back to one of your books, Lou, if I could. So I listened to your uh, book, Mob Rules, by audiobook, twice. Enjoyed it so much, I listened to it the second time. Um, you, and you flush out 88 rules in mob culture that you say can be applied to business and virtually any walk of life. Some of them range from the lighthearted to some pretty heavy philosophical uh, points that you make. Can you think of any rules in your book that you could apply to some of our SOP operators working downrange, or for uh, any planners like me, uh, it's so to consider. Yeah, I'll give a military one. I'll use one. Uh, what I did in the book, as, as, as I'm sure you saw, was I compared usually a mafia example. I would write a vignette, a mafia story. And then sometimes I would follow that up with uh, a historical story and, and show the, the, the very, very close association between what happens in the mob world and what happens in the old world. Uh, so, for example, one, one particular chapter I wrote about was seize the bull by the horns, acting decisively, which is very important no matter what you do in this world, especially uh, in places where the military is on the ground and, and second to second, minute to minute, things are changing. 
the military needs to act extremely decisively. So they used uh, an example in this particular chapter in which Crazy Joe Gallo, who was a Colombo uh, family mobster, uh, was wanted by the Colombo family. He had caused a rift in the family. He had caused a rebel, a rebellion, a war within the family. And the family needed to kill him. And they were on the lookout for him. And when they finally spotted him, they had been looking for him for months. And when they finally spotted him, he was eating Italian food in Little Italy. And the guy who spotted him ran up the block to where a couple of Colombo mobsters were eating Chinese food. And he said, I just spotted Gallo. And they said, where is he? Well, he's eating an Italian food about a block away. They immediately got on the horn. They contacted their capo. And they said, we got Gallo in our sights. What do we do? He said, quote, unquote, get Gallo hung up the phone. They ran down the block and they blasted the crap out of him. Wow. Now I used the historical example in the United States uh, in, during World War II, the United States military um, wanted Yamamoto, wasn't about to send out a hit team to look for him. Uh, we didn't do those things. We didn't do assassinations during World War II of, of, uh, of world leaders. It was something that um, is new to today. Um, when uh, Obama, it was obviously a debate about when Obama um, executed um, bin Laden. But back then, it wasn't, wasn't something they normally did. And more, more recently, uh, uh, President Trump did an attack on a, an Iranian leader. But it wasn't something back then that was normal. And when, they, when the, ja uh, the Japanese naval code was, uh, the Navy broke the code, the Japanese code, they found out that uh, Yamamoto would be flying over the Pacific. And the pilots immediately, you know, radioed back and said, we could take him out. Uh, what do you want? And they radioed back, quote, unquote, get Yamamoto. And they re-equipped their P-38 fighters for the long-range mission and intercepted his squadron and knocked him out of the sky. Goodbye to the architect of Pearl Harbor. Um, they acted strongly and decisively. Uh, they got the go-ahead immediately, and they were prepared, and they went. And I think that's necessary wherever you are in this world, uh, dealing with whoever. You know, sometimes you're going to get one opportunity to do something. And we've all been in the, that, that place in our lives where we've had an opportunity and we lost it. And then we regret it. And we, and, you know, we kick ourselves the rest of our lives going, if only I had that moment back. Well, I think it's necessary to, to seize that moment when it comes in time. That's just one example in one chapter in my book. But from, for the most part, the book is a story about how, again, to get back to the theme of agility, how agile the mob is, how they're able to sort of react to anything, anytime, anywhere. They're reactive. You know, they're not gonna, again, they're not gonna try to cause a war, but once there is a war, they're trying to figure out how are they gonna capitalize on uh, rationed food? How are they gonna capitalize on uh, uh, maybe stores of ammunition that are needed, whether at home, uh, or, you know, because it's being sucked up, the, the stores of ammunition going abroad. So there's only a limited amount at home, maybe. You know, they're going to capitalize on something. They're going to find something somewhere. And they're very reactive. So I think that you need to know that, that by, by organized criminals, the ones who are successful, are like that. And, and that's sort of what the book, the message of the book, throughout the book, is why they're so savvy and why they've always succeeded in business. And, you know, business is obviously my advice to business people, which is the book, is what the book is primarily about, is that businesses need to change with the times sometimes. And, uh, and there's also two million examples in there on how to treat people. Um, the U.S. military needs to be liked wherever they go. That's very important. You don't want soldiers getting off or, you know, a transport plane and they're hated the moment they get out. Everyone's cursing under their breath going, here's the United States, here's the Americans. Oh, no, you want people to go, here's the Americans. They're strong, they're tough, they may kick some butt, but in the end, you know what? We're happy they're here because they'll make things better. And, and, and that's important. You know, I think, I think, you know, you can't please everybody, but the overall feeling of the people that you're helping have, has to be positive. And I think no matter where you go. And that's also too in mob rules. The mob was liked. Mobsters were well liked. You know, you didn't hate the mob guy on the corner. He was actually for the people, he helped the people. He was there, he got the, you know, the guy who didn't have a job, he got him a job. The guy who didn't have money, he got him a loan. You know, you know, did he come down hard on him if the loan wasn't paid back? Not all the time. If a guy was out of work and didn't have any money, I've known plenty of guys and I did it myself. You give a guy a break. You know, let the guy, give him some slack. You know, we, we understood human nature. We understood human, human uh, problems. So, you know, where, think about the foreclosure market. 
all the people were kicked out of their houses after the crash mm. uh, here in the United States. The mob never kicked anybody out of their house if they were owed money. You know, they might have told the guy, you got you to gotta pay, but, you know, they, they didn't throw him out of the house and throw the kids out and the family, and they stayed liked. They stayed liked. They might have took over the guy's business. I'm not giving them a pass. They're not good people. They're bad people. You know, let, let, you know just not to mistake my words, but I'm not tooting their horn, but I will say that they had the savvy to at least appear where they were liked, you know, at least to put up a front and, and do things where locally people didn't want to give them up. If the police came around and asked the local mob guy, I don't know, you know, sometimes it was fear, but a lot of times it was they liked them. So just, you know, again, that's important, I think, wherever our forces go around the world, to try to at least make sure that the message is clear, that we're here to help you. We're not here to take over. We're not a colonialist nation anymore. Those days are long gone, you know, colonialism. We, and we really never got into colonialism, but, you know, to a certain degree, you know, people might argue certain places where we were. Um, those days are gone. We fought against colonialism. At the end of World War II, uh, FDR was the one who pressured Churchill to give up the colonial empire. You know, he, and, and uh, we put a lot of pressure on, uh, on the British, the, British uh, the United Kingdom to, to, to stop that. And we've done that around the world for good. We've been a force for good. And I think it's necessary for, look, my grandfather was, uh, I wear this hat. My grandfather was on the USS Tennessee, uh, 43 to 45. He was hit by a kamikaze, uh, eight bronze stars, Asiatic Pacific. Um, I actually, uh, my father, this was my grandfather's book um, here, uh, USS Tennessee. This was my father, Third Army Calvary. My father was there, um, he was there during, uh, you know, the Cold War. He went in and he was in there in the 50s and stationed in Germany. And uh, he was watching, you know, Soviet tanks were a stone's throw from my father. And he remembers it and he was ready to die for it. Um, so I, I come from actually a long history of military people. Uh, my father's oldest brothers fought the Nazis in Europe. My uncle Charlie was getting off a boat to go fight the, uh, the Germans in Europe. When, as my uncle Joe was getting on that same boat to come home, having just finished his tour. Um, my uncle Tony was island hopping at MacArthur. Uh, and my uncle JB was 8th Air Force in Europe. So, you know, my whole family, I sat at a table with all military people, and they believed in what they did, and I still believe in what they did. I think we're a force for good around the world, but I think we make sure, we need to make sure that message is always clear to the people. You know, when you see military, you think the worst. You, know, there's, you think guns, you think tanks, you think planes, you think bombs. You know, I think the military has to, you know, get it across to wherever we are that we're here to help. You know, we're, we're here for a good reason, and we're here to help you and make, make the world a better place. Yeah, well, that's a message that definitely our special forces guys will take to heart. Um, you know, oftentimes they're operating in very austere environments, and they they depend on the local populations for assistance, and they can't do their missions without them. So they call it winning hearts and minds uh, is very much a part of their of their mission set, and that's inculcated in them in their training from the earliest stages when they're when they're soldiers going through the qualification course. So that would definitely resonate with them. One other thing I would add, Lou. Um, you know, the SOCOM president's uh, reading list he comes out with every year. Routinely, we see books by people from industry, from business. We bring people from industry and business to JSAL all the time as speakers. So there's definitely a lot we in the military and the Defense Department can learn uh, from the business world and, and definitely from your books as well. Thank you again, Lou, for sharing your time. I'm sure many in the soft community will find our discussion enlightening and as transnational organized crime continues to loom as a threat to our national security interests in the future. Upcoming topics on our online interview series include more authors from the U.S. SOCOM Commander's Reading List, as well as current research conducted by JSAL faculty and senior fellows. For feedback on Think JSAL or to nominate potential speakers, please contact us at thinkjsal at socom.mil. In the meantime, you can follow JSAL on LinkedIn and Facebook or you can check out upcoming courses and events on our, on our website, which is www.socom.mil slash JSAL. That's J-S-O-U. This series is brought to you by the Strategic Studies Department of the Joint Special Operations University. Thank you all for listening.